Hi, kitty cats. I am Amethyst Herrick, your hostess for Gender Identity Weekly, a weekly discussion about identity and gender from the contributors and guests of the Purple Pop Publications website, Gender Identity Today. This content is brought to you by subscribers of Gender Identity Today. If you're already a subscriber, thank you very much. If you would like to support shows just like this one, as well as other content by our contributors, please consider subscribing using links you're going to find in the show notes. Today, here I am talking, and I am talking because I'm here with Allison Dragon, my good friend and also speech-language pathologist at Prismatic Speech Services. So hi, Allison. Thank you so much for joining me. Hello. Hello. And I might add that, unfortunately, my name is still Heaster at Prismatic Speech Services and in all my formal ways of living because I haven't yet gotten to change it to Dragon because it is such a process to change a name, as we all oh, know. Oh, I hear, I heard that. Yeah, I've never had to go through it. So, you know, it is not sarcasm. Fun to change a name. But mm -hmm. No. Yeah, no, yeah you have no idea, right? <laughs> I do know a good attorney who might be able to help in the process of changing seriously, names. Seriously, seriously, I'm going to take a second job too to pay for it. Right, it's a little pricey. right. Yeah, it's ridiculous. The whole thing. Yeah. yeah. But you one and I. One more thing. <laughs> right. One more thing. One more thing to think about. But Allison, you and I connected in. I guess it was the end of 2022, I believe. Um, no, sorry, 2021. Wait, right? No, 2022. Who cares about the dates? But yes. we connected when I was looking for for a voice therapy for for you know some some lessons so that I could get uh, make a more feminine voice. Now, <clears throat> excuse me. There we go. Already, it's crapping out. We're like four minutes in, three minutes in, and I it's crapping out. Okay, <laughs> there you know goes what to do. Voice. You know what to do. <laughs> right. Belly breath. Should I right? Should I pause and pull out the straw? There you we'll go. talk about this. There so. you go. All right. You so the the reason I want I wanted to make this this uh, video. So I spoke with Kevin Dorman. Um, I don't know what it was. It was maybe a couple of months ago that I spoke with Kevin. Yeah. About voice and gender, and so so when I spoke with Kevin, um, what we talked about was. More about gender from a – more like a gender – a general general gender standpoint. And we didn't speak a tremendous amount about just communication. But, Allison, I have spoken a lot about, about com just communication with you. In fact, I even – I know that one of our conversations turned into an article that I wrote about how difficult it is just to begin doing – to be – you know, to communicate with, with a new voice and a new – like methodology because it's such an external representation i mean of who we are i mean it's really it's our identity made manifest yeah it's an external representation of a lot of inside work i think yes yes you much know? more than just um you know technique it's much more than than uh technical aspects mm -hmm. there's a whole like a whole personality almost that that, that you effect to go from, you know, um, communicating, at least in my case, to communicating as a man to communicating, you know, more, more feminine way. Now, what was interesting and the reason why you and I have had a lot of other conversations is that you are cisgender and heterosexual. And for the most part, you've worked, or at least what you prefer, you know, the people you prefer to work with are in the rainbow, it's not in some way. I'm transgender, yeah. obviously. If it hadn't leapt off the the screen, and those are when your work at Prismatic Speech Services, incidentally linked in the show notes. I will I will link that. Um, your work there is all with non-binary and transgender people, right? Yes, it, currently it is. Yes, um, okay. but anyone can change their voice. You know, it can be any kind of gender representation and I might add too that um folks can have multiple voices um and you don't have Very to be true. a voice actor or a method actor or you know any kind of an act you don't have to be someone who does that professionally you just might feel safer or more comfortable having more than one voice that you would like 
to make authentically yours. So I find that whole aspect of voices in general really cool and really fascinating, in case you couldn't tell. <laughs> I do, too. So, so yeah, because I think we kind of geek out a little bit on, <laughs> you know, on technique. I mean, on a lot of things, really. But yeah. <laughs> The the thing that um, the thing that kind of gets me because because when when I when you know Kevin and I were talking, there was one aspect of my conversation with them that was about you know how do you how do you teach this you know one of one of the the conversations we had was you know you are and, and I'm just gonna you know I'm gonna plat, pound on this but cisgender no, and heterosexual <laughs> yeah no cause in it's, a world you know it's a thing. Yeah, in in a world of rainbow, and and an interesting thing. Normally, when I go into some place, like almost all, almost always, I'll go in some place and I'm the minority, right? I walk in and and people go, "What the? Who's the? Who is this?" That is sort of the typical experience for transgender people, you know. And and it's you know depending mm -hmm. upon the level. To you know the level to which you can you can pass, um, you know it it might be, especially with communication that's one of you know that's a decent tell you know you walk into walk into some place you may have fabulous makeup and heels, and then then if you present with a more masculine style of communication you know that's it's a it's a good it's a good tell. So so that takes a lot of you know has taken a decent amount of effort. I mean. What she's we we did lessons for what six months, seven yeah, months, it was around six months, something like yeah. that, and we yeah. still talk occasionally. And you're like, "Hey, try this." <laughs> we'll be like, "Damn, I thought it was done." <laughs> no, you're never done. But that's my experience. Everywhere I go, I I'm in a minority, and so I, I you know one of my first questions actually is like, "How does because because now it's switched." You know, you at Prismatic, you work with predominantly non-binary and transgender people. So let me just ask that question first. I mean, how does that feel for this to be flipped around, for you to be a minority as a cisgender heterosexual person? It feels a lot of things. Um, I will say I finally feel like I have the biggest most meaningful purpose to my work mm. that I've ever yeah. had um, because I, I've i been a speech pathologist for over 20 years and I've kind of like done it all and I truly, I, I think I mentioned this to you when we first met, there was a time period right probably the year before I'd met you that I was thinking of maybe just hanging it up, that right. um, I was a little burnt out, dare I say. Um, I loved all my clients. I love helping people. But my thought was there might be something else out there for me. And sure. when I, I realized what the missing piece was, it was something relatable um, in the idea of putting so much work into yourself and how the right people to help you with that can make all the difference because sometimes it's yeah. exhausting. Very it much. is. And not to make it too much about me, but the part that I relate to is growing up. I knew from a very young age, I didn't fit in a lot of ways. I knew I had mental health struggles from a very young age and growing up in the seventies and eighties and being in my 20s and the 90s, those were not things that were necessarily talked about and identified as you know the way they are now. And thank sure. God that they are, right? There's yes. a, The young people today can be so much more open about that, and I love it. But right. that being said, when I finally did in my 20s start to do work on myself, had I not had someone to validate me and give me feedback in real time, and to help me make sense of what I had been feeling all those years prior to getting help and start to feel whole as a person, um, I wouldn't be here right now. It saved me. Right. It saved right. my life. Oh, agreed. Um, yeah. So knowing what I know about what I've lived and not even having gender be part of that big 
struggle or that big package of work that I realized I needed to do to feel whole. Um, when I met my first client that was working on gender affirming voice, um, I, I had come out of a training that just sparked something in me that was, I have some knowledge that I could be that person like nice. Marianne, the person I refer to in my life, she was my first therapist um, of one kind, and I literally call my life pre-Marianne and post-Marianne. <laughs> um, if I can use what knowledge I have to have that kind of an impact, that's what I want to do. That right. is what right. I want to do. And that's kind of how it all became very much a passion for me, and I feel like I'm finally doing something that might be be what I'm meant to do as long as I'm doing yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. So so if I were to to try to sum up at all and and tell me where I get wrong, but I mean this this ended up being really a lot like a life's purpose. And and so there is no so when I say how does that feel to to be in a in a position where you've become the minority, like your answer is it feels really damn good because you're making really a difference. Good. Yeah. I, and it feels actually, good to be, yeah, a minority, but I'm an ally and I can right. become an accomplice mm -hmm. to a community that needs a cis woman ally in the millions and a cis man right. ally and people to fight for them who are maybe connected in different ways because unfortunately in our society sometimes gender does that if you are a cis yes. man or a woman you know right, and right. if I can then use anything about being a cis woman to be an active accomplice not just an ally I feel like why wouldn't I you know yeah. it's it just fits for me and it's humbling to be a minority it is about learning for me right. and right. respecting folks who I just want to be able to learn and spread my knowledge. So it feels damn good. And it feels, and I, I don't want to say empowering for me. Um, it feels passionate. It feels exciting. It feels necessary and it feels right. Is beautiful. I mean, honestly, I mean, it really just kind of does. <laughs> I couldn't plan it, you know, to say that, like just thinking I'm about sure. it, but it's humbling. It is humbling because I want to not have this. But do, I mean, do you know, for like for both of us, I mean, you know, there's, it's a huge, I mean, there are two, two aspects that are two sides that I want to, you know, think about this because there's, there's the way that, that you you know, need to, need to, to work with, you know, this, with my community, but then there's also a way that, that, you know, my community, you know, needs to work with you really with the rest of society. And, you know, it's very, it is very difficult to work on, to work on this, this, to do this work, you know, it is. and you had mentioned validation and validation is, yeah, to get, I mean, to be able to walk, to go in somewhere and ask for something I don't even care, a cup of coffee, and not to be perceived as remarkable um, is a huge, huge thing. Because that's like the number, if there's one thing I wanted in my, in my transition is to be able to walk somewhere and have people, you know, glance at me and just kind of glance away, just go, oh, oh, lady there with purple hair, odd. And then move on, you know, not, not have it be a, a huge thing, so... Yeah. It's humbling for us both. You you enable us, and and you know, it was very difficult to get you know anywhere along the line. So, thank you. Well, well let's. I want let's talk about um, you know your communication toward the uh, the community, and I'm really thinking more as a as a speech pathologist, not as um, because your allyship is is awesome. I mean, you know. I could bring up all the pride things you go to. I mean, you even flew to, to Colorado for a pride thing. Um, I mean, yeah, there's a lot that I could bring up. But but one of the things that I had originally talked about with Kevin had to do with, you know, what they were calling microaggressions. Mm 
Mm-hmm. And, and they're they're small things, right? I mean, it could well. I mean, misgendering is not necessarily a small thing, but ways of um, you know communicating that that might that get perceived. Here's a good one. <laughs> All right, I'm just gonna. So when we go to a restaurant, when my wife and I go to a restaurant, you know, the when I was growing up saying, hey, guys, was totally normal because that's just what you do. Now I hear that. All right. Before I wouldn't have cared. But now my wife are sitting, wife and I are sitting at a table. And if a, a you know, a server comes up and goes, are you guys ready? And sort of I want to go, why didn't you say ladies? What did that? What are you trying to say? Was there like, what did you guess? You've been here two seconds. How could you possibly have clocked me? What is wrong with you? That's it. I'm out of here. I'm going to move. I'm going to go. I'm going to go to McDonald's. You just made me go. to Screw this whole world. I'm going to New Zealand. And the server is probably like, um, so coffee then is off the right. list because you probably had too much, you know? And if the server <laughs> didn't realize Oh, and it was brought to that server's attention. I would hope that they would apologize. Maybe. And but, but that was that's the thing is that that's totally normal communication. On, yeah, like I know it's that's a lot sort of, of learning, listening and learning. Like, but, it, but like I sh- but it's something that like I wouldn't. In general, I shouldn't even be worried about. Mm, I mean, you're not I'm allowed to, to say think... you're not allowed to shit all mm. over yourself. All right. <laughs> it felt how it let's well, say it feels how it feels, right? It feels how oh, it feels. Sure. Sure. Feelings are valid. They are. I've done it. I've done it accidentally. I've done it never intentionally. I've hate I've I've I said something once like, oh man, or man, we're gonna do this. And it was like <gasps> I caught myself and I thought that sounded terrible, like Uh to, you know, and I thought that's, I, I apologized and we Mm. moved on, but it was like, cause you know, one of those things growing up, like, oh man, like, or man, that's cool. I've taken gender out of my language as much as I can, but I've done it. I've done it. I've done it. I've done it. I hate when I do it. I hate it. (laughs) I I will tell you, I just feel like an ass. Like I do because, because of what I do. And right, it's right. so many, but I will say some of it is that habitual stuff and language that we oh, grew up oh, with yeah. that used right. to be not paid as much attention to. And once you've learned what not to do and then you do it, it is, it's my responsibility to do better because now I have the knowledge, right? Yes. The hard part is. I'm not going to say that I won't do it again accidentally, like with misgendering or with, and that is truly out of like keeping track of in my 52 year old brain of they, or he, because again, there's more pronouns that I can say now, which is so cool. And there's more for me to keep track of. It's my responsibility to be more mindful of that, to pause and shut my mouth and listen more, which is hard because I get excited and start talking, talking, talking. And you know what? I, one of the biggest things I'm working on is learning how to take that pause and just give myself that second before saying something and put a little extra thought and consideration into what I say. Theoretically, that's what I'm working on. Because I don't want that thing to happen that you described that could potentially happen in the restaurant. Because right. one little thing I say, and I want to be called out on that. That's the other thing I'd like to say. Tell me. Be like, you know what? That really, that word really bothered me. You don't even have to tell right. me why. But tell me so I can apologize and make it right. Because that's just, to me, being a good human. See, I think that's become atypical. I mean, and I'm, you know, I'm glad. I, no, sorry. Let me rephrase that. I'm not it's glad important. that it's atypical. Yeah, I'm glad that you're willing to to think about it and to do something about it. Because it's interesting to hear people say, well, you know, why should I worry about pronouns? And it's, you know, there, there's a, an aspect of identity there that you negate. You just go, look, you don't actually have an identity. You got nothing because I choose not to treat you as the person you are. 
Exactly. But, like, now, I mean, I'll, let me turn this around, you know, on me. Because growing up, um, um, you know, in Southern California, all of, like, everybody was a dude. So in the 80s, you know, everybody was, oh, dude, yeah, really, dude? Oh, yeah, dude. Yeah, totally. My you daughter calls difference. me dude. Right. <laughs> she does. <laughs> But it was, and I, you know, I'm, I grew up in the Valley in the 80s. So, you know, there was a lot of, I already, I say totally all over the place. I'll say like about every third word. And I still use dude. And I'll catch myself. And I have, I have another, as a transgender woman friend who is always going, oh man, did you see such and such? And every so often I'll go, whoa, but can, can, I, what I, can you call me a woman? You know, and she'll go, What? What I even say? And I said, well, you said, oh, man, such and such. And she'll go, okay, let it go, will you? My point was going to be. You know, be, that's interesting. Every person has what their own desire is, and that is right. okay to be respected. If right. that makes you uncomfortable, I want to know. But, like, dude will fall out of my mouth, and I'll go, I, sorry, I didn't, I didn't mean, like, dude. I mean, like, dude, dude. It was like. Dude, it was like, dude, it was just like, dude. And the person would be like, yeah, I don't, you just quit your valleying, okay? Yeah, that <laughs> might be more, the most offensive thing, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Quite likely, but. Ooh, did you hear but, that cackle? That was the most offensive thing. You're going to have to edit that out. <laughs> I will do so. I'll, Please I'll do. make sure to, I'll put a bleep on that. Please do, bleep so, me. So, is there, but do, like, do I, so. Out of curiosity, because, I mean, I don't think this is true. I just gave you my opinion before asking yours. Mm -hmm. Maybe not the best interview technique. Eh. But, like, I don't like I don't think I get a free pass to that. You know, like, I'm, like if, you know, somebody has has wants to be addressed a certain way. I don't I don't deserve more leniency. That's my belief. I mean, if if you're going to watch what you say, I kind of need to watch. What? I mean, not even kind of. I also need to watch what I say. Um, so, I mean, let me just ask that. Do you, I mean, should we all be on the same standard? That's an, I've never been asked this before. Um, you know what my standard is? On my fridge, the number one rule of life, and I can't take credit for this. Um, I have to credit Pearl Jam. <laughs> <laughs> it's good. I think it's Stone Gossard from Pearl Jam. The number one yeah. rule is, like, don't be an asshole. Yeah. I mean, right. like, and the the number two rule on my fridge is that actions speak louder than words. True. Very so true. I feel like those simple little rules could be good things to live by that, you know, without doing the whole do unto others thing and even going there. But if I want to be respected for my pronouns, I'm going to respect you for your pronouns. And I am going to honor right. the fact that I have the knowledge. Like I said, I have the knowledge that this is something that's important to someone else. And if mm -hmm. I have that knowledge, um, no matter what my personal feelings are about it, um, I am going to make sure that I at least am doing everything I can to try to respect what they want for example, to be called or what sure. they want their name to be. or um, So as far as you getting a free pass, you don't, you had said something earlier that implied that maybe you would think that you do. Or, or First of all, I don't, it's never come across to me that you would expect like a free pass. Like to me, it would come across that you're more aware because of, what you've experienced in your life. What do you think about that? Well, so you would think, like, I would think, I would think that my community would hold me to a higher standard. And and yet I actually made, you know, when I spoke to Kevin, not to keep bringing this up, right, I ended up making a public apology for, gosh, I, mis I misgendered you, Kevin. I can't believe that. And uh, so I would think that I, should be on a higher standard because I should be aware of this. Um, that's my, that's my take, but it's odd. It's odd. I have spoken with other transgender people who are just like, look, let it go. You know, this is just how I talk. 
So I don't know. I mean, it's a weird, you know, two directional kind of thing that I go. You know what I think? I think it validates how human we all are and how we all, we all really have our intention to do the right thing or, you know, we're going to, we're going to mess up sometimes. And I think the bigger, the bigger aspect of it all, the bigger picture, I think, and the more important even part of it is, okay, we're human. We're going to have our day that we're going on three hours of sleep and maybe the brain just doesn't have room for that one last pronoun I need to remember. (laughs) And I accidentally misgender someone and how I, oh, I just hit my computer (laughs) talking with my hands. (laughs) No, but (laughs) how I handle that is way bigger because yes, I'm human. I'm going to screw up. I'm going to accidentally do this. But like you said, explaining, making good, and just offering an apology, um, just being, being real and being respectful and being honest. And then like remembering to try harder next time, because like the next time it might be like, Allison, put more thought into those pronouns rather than like what, I don't know, like what shoes you're going to wear later when you change your outfit or, you know what I mean? Right. All those things that are swirling around in your brain mm-hmm. and, and if oh, you're yeah. stressed or you're sleep deprived or you're just, you're thinking faster than you're listening. Sometimes let's face it. We listen to someone and while they're speaking, instead of truly listening and hearing them, we're formulating our response already. You, and usually we are not a rebuttal. fully listening. Yeah. Usually a rebuttal, right? And, well, right. this is why you're wrong, but <laughs> but it's it's or and another yes and because that's what I, my interjections that can turn into interruptions inadvertently and then I I apologize and I'll say sure. oh my goodness I did not mean to interrupt you I was so excited about what you said I had meant that to be an interjection but I feel like I cut you off yeah and yeah. I'm sorry and I mean but I mean, if it, so it's, it's really, not as big know. as a pronoun. It's not as big as a pronoun, but it's important no. to acknowledge that because I feel like a pronoun is is part of someone's identity, their name. It's it's right. to me a big deal. Right, right. So really, it it ends up being. You know, we need to be. I had a word for it. I think just cognizant, you know, of of what we're doing. Because there are people I know would more than happily. I mean, there I have had people more than happily, use. He, you know, he, him pronouns for me, like even now, because it's just like, look, what I want to piss you off, mm-hmm. you know, and I go, and well, that's the difference. Thanks. Yes, yes, that's a willful. That is willfully mm-hmm. saying, look, I know what your your preferred pronouns are, and I'm gonna I'm gonna choose not to use them. So, yeah, and in my opinion, that's just being rude, unkind, disrespectful, a, all of the yeah. above. Shitty. That is, I'm going to, yes. you know, I mean, let's just face it. And then, and people will do that, but this is yeah. a very different, yeah. um, I've, you know, to really take it back to your question about, should you be more aware? Well, we can all should all over ourselves about all the things yeah. that we should do. But again, I think that this just, if this does not just point to how important it is for us to value each other as humans and give each other a little bit of rope, a little right. bit of grace. And right. if we all did that a little bit and especially could laugh at ourselves and take responsibility for our screw ups, yes, you know, um, but also acknowledge if it's a moment that I've offended someone where laughing is not an option. Um, I want that person to feel heard. And I want that person to feel validated. And like I said, I want them to let me know if they feel that way. And I think that's part of me being an ethical, considerate therapist on top of being a good human. That's just an important part of the work I do. Right, right. So so let me actually, I I like, you and I have had this conversation because I like turning this around. Because what you're what you're saying is we we ought to be considerate and listen to people. And if we mess up, then we should be able to tell uh, that person should be able to tell us. 
hey, there was a mess up, please fix it. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but the reason I came to you in the first place was at least in part so that I didn't have to correct everybody in society, so that I leave my house and I don't have to, to say, listen, I use she, her pronouns, but the rather, hopefully, people would look at my presentation, they would look, listen to my communication and would naturally assume that that she, her pronouns are, are appropriate. Mm -hmm. Because I've I've thought you know we've we've talked about this and you know I've mentioned there are demonstrations that I've personally done, um, and now I'm trying to figure out how to back into this easily because like if I were a speech language pathologist, I think I'd be able to not even I think like I know what struggles I faced you know I personally um, transgender men I think have a little bit on transgender women because the testosterone will naturally, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, lengthen their vocal tract, um, you know, and, and, mm -hmm. uh, thicken, thicken vocal folds. But, uh, yeah, I got like halfway through a thought. Where the hell was I going? Oh, so I know what struggles I faced. <laughs> um, and I would think to myself, where my, sort of a natural conclusion would be, well, if I were going to be an SLP, like I would be able to tell somebody, no, 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 do this instead. You know, don't do this, try that. But at the same time, like I was not socialized as a girl. I mean, I can say that, you know, <laughs> so mm -hmm. I would think that actually makes me less qualified. Because when you and I first first spoke, we focused on technical aspects. Mm -hmm. Right. She said, well, raise your larynx, you know, mm -hmm. move your tongue forward, whatever it all is, you know, constrict the bit at the top of the throat, whatever the hell that is. Mm -hmm. Clearly, I'm not an SLP. Yeah, okay. No, well, I mean, no, like, a, like And you know what? It's top. more important that you feel it, right? That you feel that, right. <laughs> that raising and lengthening and or shortening, rather, and pulling yeah. back like that. Yeah. I'm talking way, right at, way up at the top, right? There were two, there were two sphinctery type things. There's, I mean, there's the larynx and then, you know what, actually, let's do <laughs> Yeah, don't even because this will turn into a big right. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody listening will be like, "Listen, I didn't want a lesson. I just wanted to. What's your question? Ask the question. I mean, you know, because the because I think I would consider myself less qualified because I cannot teach. I cannot teach cisgender communication. Cisgender woman communication is what I mean. You were socialized as a girl, and then you know you continue to socialize as a woman. And I know I've heard other people say, well, no, I would want a transgender person to teach me because they, you know, those people would know better. So, And they've done that work, right? They've done the change. Right. They've made the physical changes to their own voices. I get that. Yes. Yes. Now, because I, because I think like very communication, well, I think being able to do this consistently requires, I don't have a better word for this, proprioception is the word that I have, but it, it's, it's, it's being able to sense, you know, being able to sense your body. Yeah. Uh, maybe I can just put a period there, but yeah. Being proprioceptive able to sense awareness what's... is huge. You're okay. right. You're right. Okay. Um, and being able to perceive things. We all are different types of learners. We've talked about this. Like mm -hmm. we use all of our senses to learn, but some of us have more strength in different areas. So when, I'm meeting someone, um, I am finding out a little bit from them about like, okay, are you more of a visual learner? Are you more of an auditory learner? Tell me, does this make sense to you? Do you hear this or do you need me to kind of teach you what to hear? Do you right. feel this? Um, how do we find a way for you to feel this? Um, sometimes it's recording. Sometimes we're not comfortable recording. So we do other right. ways. Um, Sometimes it takes a lot of time. Sometimes it's like, oh, I heard that immediately. Um, and the same thing goes for like those socializing, like, like you said, I was socialized as a girl and we'll just say a girl, the societal definition of what a girl yes. does. Right. And, and right, right. now there is some research about different 
perceived types of communication, mm. right? Like the the stereotypical man and the stereotypical woman do do some different kinds of nonverbal things. So yes. it's it's a matter I think of like like I I'm aware of it because a it's my profession, but B, I've always been really interested in it. I like studying people. I'm a people watcher. Right. I, I'm, I like, I have a curious nature about all of those things. Um, however, as far as me kind of knowing a little more or being, I, I think it's a matter of how aware someone is. Because there could be another cis woman in this room who has never thought about or paid any attention to that whatsoever. Um, so it's an interesting opinion. And I think when it comes to finding someone to do voice work, that's why I think it's really important to take advantage of like, usually there's a 30 minute free consultation for, mm -hmm. for um, someone to meet that potential therapist and really see for that client to make sure that they are being seen and right. heard and that they can build a rapport and feel comfortable. And that's whether that, that voice therapist is trans or cis, or I think there has to be, um, an awareness of a voice therapist to look at the whole person that they're working with. Yeah. And also ask a lot of questions as to, well, are you interested in learning about nonverbals and these right, different types right. of things? How comfortable are you with that? How much have you thought about that as part of communication and some of those other styles of socializing um, mm -hmm. and moving the body that has nothing to do with the pitch of your voice? Because, again, right. it's all part of that, right? You brought up. I got to tell you, my, my opinion was I would rather work with a cisgender woman because I assumed that there would be the awareness. And, and so what you've brought up is that it's not, it's not the person and it's not the person's socialization is whether or not you're capable of, of observing what, you know, what goes into communication. Mm -hmm. I hadn't considered that. So, so thank you. Oh, you're but, welcome. And I think you, you're right about, like, you want someone who is in tune to maybe some of the things that you want. Because everyone's definition of feminine or masculine is different. There is yes. not a rule. Like, so that is where that therapist, they need to be a listener as to what fits and what feels feminine to Amethysta. What sure, feels, sure. what, what, because there are many cis women who maybe don't fit that stereotypical m model or box of what right, feminine right. is, you know, it mm -hmm. depends. Look at the different eras in our world of fashion and what even sure, defined feminine sure. and women's roles. So it becomes a big, like suddenly, um, a lot bigger than just a label. It, it's all about looking at the whole person. Right, right. I guess, see, I was thinking more about me being capable of observing some, you know, as I learn technical aspects, um, you know, being able to observe my my therapist more than any. Like, that's what I was thinking. Ooh, but but, okay. but that, because, I mean, that puts the, the observation on me, the awareness that, you know, I was on me because I, you know, I, if I went into like a restaurant, you know, I sat down in a restaurant, somebody walks up and I, you know, even if I had a, a bright high pitched voice, if I went coffee, black, do you have a newspaper? Thank you. And go back to my, you know, like that, mm -hmm. that's, that is as opposed to, Hey, how are you? Can I get a cup of coffee? Yes. Black. Thank you. Oh, gosh. Do you have a newspaper, too? Oh, awesome. Thank you. You know, very different. But that's like me watching other people, you know. 
and and I think other women, probably a few men. Didn't Can mean I to interject? Anybody there? So please, Can please I interject. interject. Yeah, because I wasn't sure where the hell I was going with that. No, anyway, I have so such go. a question. No, okay, I go. have a question. Did what? you learn some of that from watching me, or was it me? Saying oh yes, to you. Because my other thought is, as a quality therapist, I am a facilitator. Sure. I'm going to guide you to do a lot of this work safely, but I am going to also advise and say, hmm. So what I'm hearing is you want to do a little more of this, this, and this. Mm-hmm. So this week, go when you're out at a restaurant, I want you to observe right. and think about things that you like, think about things you don't like. If it's not so, as a voice therapist, I think, again, um, that awareness is if you're not going to get that from me as a yeah. cis woman, yeah. It is my responsibility and my job to say to you, like, hey, Go you know on. what? Yeah. Because remember, we don't want you to be a cookie cutter of me. We want you to right. find what works for mm-hmm. your expression right. of your gender. So that is all a big part of it. There's a lot of, I think we can definitely conclude this, you and I, that there is a very like give and take symbiotic kind of feeding relationship between I think a voice therapist and the client because we're figuring it out together and we're creating something. It's a good point. I mean, I'll answer your question because there was something I I wanted yeah. to go into this. Even yeah. did like, you learn that as, from me? <laughs> at least partly. Flipping the hands around. <laughs> at least, part, but there was something you were saying, and I thought, oh, this is a great you know, intro into what I was going to say. Now, of course, I've forgotten it because... Because you know, I talk so much. I made no, you forget. Well, this is what we like do. <laughs> <laughs> but it's been like 15 minutes and I got a really short attention span. But because um, there was something, you, I don't know, you tilted your head, you did something or another, and, and I don't know what it was. But I was going to say, right, because that's an aspect of communication that is... that. Well, it was when you were talking about nonverbal stuff. It was when you, you, when you said that sentence, when you said... Because there are a lot of nonverbal things that you might not even think about. And I'm exaggerating, but... <laughs> no, I probably did that. But I, but I wanted to go, <laughs> right, like how you just said that sentence. But now, but you've, you know, you've made it clear, you know, to me now that that you, ultimately the, the facilitation that needs to go on is to teach me the, the observation. Because, I mean, communication at the end of the day, like if you don't feel that... I think is what how you're trying, and then I'm putting new words into it. But like, if I don't feel something, I'm not going to be able to to act it well. Mm-hmm. And at the very beginning, it's an act mm-hmm. until it becomes. I was, oh. th- sorry, did I steal your thought? Right, no, no. You add it, it's these great minds are thinking alike I, because. Well, I, hang on, I'll go get a great mind. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> <laughs> because. This is so true. That is exactly what I was going to say because you know what's really hard? And I can – this is me having empathy because um, I feel like it would be very hard as a client to be feeling like this has to be a little performative at first Mm -hmm. when the exact thing that that client does not want to be doing is living their life or communicating in a way that feels – not authentic or performative. It's like, hello, I'm here because I don't want to be, I, I want to be but authentic. It has, but it has to start that way. And that's for uh, practice. Yes. For the purpose right. of practice, right? Because you have to try on maybe some different sounds and movements. Yeah. And yeah. you have to, I don't want to say you have to, it helps if you can kind of get comfortable with playing with it a little. Yes. Yeah. You know? And accepting, like, playing with sounds, playing with voices, playing with, like, when voices feel this way, they sound like this. Or Mm -hmm. um, it helps a lot because it's, I I lost it now. (laughs) Oh, the, yeah, no, the performative part of things can be a stepping stone. Right, right. To finding what fits as something that feels authentic. Right. You know, and, and not because, you know, I've got to plug myself in this, too, because 
what we're talking about here is is you know runs along the Judith Butler's um, performativity aspect of gender. You know her her mm -hmm. sorry their point. My apologies, mm -hmm. Dr. Butler. Um, their point is you know that it's really it's a performance that you give to society, and I disagree at least in the. It also has to work for you, which I think is sort of what we're trying to say, mm -hmm. that it can't just be a performance. It has to be a performance that is internalized or that's a weird mm -hmm. way of putting it. We have to become ultimately, you know, method. I had to become a method actress mm -hmm. first and I had to live myself as Amethysta before that living could could come out uh, naturally. In In some ways, apparently, I'm like Robert De Niro. Only like about a thousand percent prettier, right? A thousand. At a least thousand a thousand. And one. Probably there's going to be somebody who's going to mm -hmm. comment on this video and go, mm -hmm. not really. No, Robert mm -hmm. De Niro's I, maybe a little prettier. But. I don't find Robert De Niro that pretty. I think that no, like you're never, much prettier. But. If, I, mean, I mean, I could get real petty, but I won't. I'll be a good... <laughs> Apologies, Since we have five apologies to left. Robert De Niro too. Yes. Yeah, sorry, sorry. I, didn't I mean, mean no to... hate. I mean, you know, you're a good actor and everything. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, great actor. You just know. you know, yeah. I'm it's not going to hang out with you and and try yeah. to try to emulate you. That's all I'm going to say. Yeah, so. and you know, there's a range. I'm going to add to like, let's think about us as humans. We all this this keeps going back to how I feel like it is so important to not fit into boxes or labels or have these parameters, right. which right. unfortunately are necessary for functioning in our world, even for things like insurance coverage and, you know, all those obvious things, right? Sometimes it is necessary, but in the places where it's not necessary, um, when we can be fluid and we can be very uh, dynamic, yeah. I think that that's living life. And for each person fluid and dynamic has a different range. Mm -hmm. So, um, to agree with you about how important it is to feel like, I don't know, to me, just putting on a performance for the world, you know, for gender being that, that seems robotic to me because I think that right. there is a big feeling part of our souls and to mm -hmm. each person, I think, you know, there's a different level of that. Some of us are more sensitive than others. Right. Some right. of us who have, um, who are neurodivergent, like myself, have a lot of um, rejection sensitivity that might be a mm -hmm. little higher than someone else. So pair that with someone who is also trans. They may be more, it may be more important to feel that that voice is more authentic rather than someone who's like, you know what? I really kind of don't care. I want to pass and this is okay for me. And that's all like, there's no right or wrong, right? It's all just sure. like, well, let's play with this. Let me validate you. Mm -hmm. Let me help get you and facilitate, you know, you getting to where you want to get with that. I right. think, right. You know, but we can't put everything in a box and, have that. I just agree with you to disagree with Dr. Butler. Sorry, Dr. Butler. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry, not yeah. sorry. <laughs> yeah. But, I mean, the, you have a... See, the thing was... Wow, let me try to pull that one back together. Because originally, when I started doing this, it kind of... It was a performance. And it was a performance because it's so difficult to apply this to my whole life. Because yeah. I had 52 years, almost, well, running on 53 years of life that I communicated a certain way. And right. bring, bringing in a new style was very difficult, very, uh, very stressful. Yeah. But once I started doing it, once I, once, I, once I would perform, make a performance for 10 minutes and nobody batted an eye, I went, oh, well, then this is okay. And so now, you know, the way that I the way that I, that I communicate it like now it feels good, I guess is where I was trying to go. Mm -hmm. It, it started off with just saying, well, how, you know, how do I, how do I seem more natural? You know, how can I seem more natural to the, to the way I wanted to? And now it's become, well, but that, but that actually makes me feel natural. And, and that's, mm -hmm. you know, that was ultimately and that's kind the of process. The 
Yeah. That is the process. And it's yeah. difficult. Like you'll be the oh, first so person hard. to say, <laughs> it is so hard. It's emotional. Yeah. It's frustrating. Yes. It is, it is all the things. I mean, we could spend, I mean, we have like two minutes, but we could do right. another, we could talk about how, I mean, there were things that, you know, we worked through times where we took a break and you know what, yeah. it was needed and that was honoring what, what was needed at the time. Mm-hmm. And it was all yeah. part of that process. And I, I should have asked if that was okay for me to say, but I feel like it kind of was. It was not. <laughs> Can't believe I'm hanging up. No, I mean, it's true. <laughs> and I wish, you know, like, honestly, I would love to do another, you know, another show about that. I'm thinking about it because we, we have two minutes. And so let me go ahead and wrap up so that you can go to what you're going to, but and communication is such a huge topic. It is not technical. I mean, it's partly technical. It's not performative, but it's partly performative. And it's not just feeling good about yourself, although it's part of that. And so, so that's so that's got to be our next topic. I get you know, let's let's meet back up in a month or something. Seriously, and you know, I will. It, it kind of made me feel like saying that this was the biggest thing too. Like when. One is working on, like, if you're working on your voice, think about it. Speaking's a lot like breathing. We just do it. Yes. Suddenly, we are thinking about every little aspect of it. And all the things that you used to do with your voice that we could call it, you know, your dead voice or your old voice or your former (laughs) voice, whatever. Those were all things you did without ever thinking unless you were thinking maybe in a negative way or thinking like, Oh, I want to change that. Or, Oh, I don't love that. Or, you know, it it got to a point that has brought you now into this affirming voice therapy. Right. So, but there was a time that it was just habitual. Mm -hmm. Now, as we know, you're working on this new voice, you're creating this. You are literally taking something that was once habitual and creating and relearning how to do all the things that you did with the old voice, but now do them in a new way with this voice that you've created. And you are unlearning old mm-hmm. and learning new simultaneously while dredging up potentially emotional stuff. Right, right. <laughs> I mean, it's it's a lot at the most. I don't want it to sound like terrifying or horrible, but I think it's important to call it what it is on a, on a range of like, it is, like you said, it's a big part of who we are and a representation of who we are, whatever that representation is and whatever that pronoun or that gender is, you know, it's a big, so I'm honored to help those who are doing this work get there because it just makes me feel very, 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 I guess, satisfied and just fulfilled. It makes me feel really Mm -hmm. fulfilled because I can use the stuff that I learned like about the technical stuff, but I can also use my life experiences and without getting into too much about me, even some of my own experiences with mental health, my own experiences with some childhood gender stuff that you and I did talk about, that yes. could be a whole nother thing, even though I am I a know. cisgender woman, right? <laughs> I, there I were some about gender that issues. Was like, mm. <laughs> like, there's so much that I feel like I really was called. So until the day that someone tells me, you suck, you should not do this anymore, I'm going to be doing this because I, I just, I love it. And I've learned something from every one of my clients. And that's like throughout my years as a speech pathologist, I like to learn, Um, but not to hijack your wrap up, but that's kind of what I've enjoyed talking to you about this a lot today. Cause I think it's kind of made me feel really excited to go see my next clients later. Right. Well, I, yeah, I want to I want to do a follow up because because I think an interesting point, and I'm going to let you go. I think an interesting point is how it what it does take to to integrate this into into you know real life, I guess as they put it. Yeah. So. Yeah. But it's that's a lot. next time. Yeah. Very All cool. Right. Well, I look forward to it. 
Yeah, absolutely. Allison, thank you so much. You know, well, hopefully you know how much I love you. Um, and I love you, you know. back. I hope you know. And thank I'm honored you. to be on absolutely. your pod. Your, is this a podcast? Because we're recording ourselves so. video. We're doing video, I know. Too. It's like a video slash it's a, who knows. It's a pitio cast. <laughs> yeah, it's a pitio cast. It's so. a vodcast. <laughs> Perfect. There you go. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you again, Allison. Thank you. Bye, Emmy. Bye. <laughs>